Well, I think uh, it's uh, time now. So uh, maybe we should we should start our uh, uh, forum. Uh, so uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I am uh, Dr. Mohammad Zahed Khan, uh, co-organizer of this forum. And uh, you know, on behalf of our committee, I would like to welcome you all, especially the speakers who have given their time uh, to present their work uh, in this forum. Uh, so as per the schedule, uh, we will have uh, two sessions uh, and then uh, we will conclude with a short uh, panel discussion. But first, uh, I would like to uh, you know, welcome Dr. Adi Mokhebel, uh, who is the director of the Center for Communication Systems and Sensing, uh, to start the welcome talk. And uh, this forum uh, we have organized jointly uh, with our uh, interdisciplinary center for communication systems and sensing and our electrical engineering department. Uh, Dr. Adi, the dais is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Assalamu alaikum, everybody. I'd like to welcome you to KFUPM virtually and we will hope to see you uh, uh, physically. On behalf of the vice president of for research and innovation, uh, Dr. Ali Sheikhi, uh, I'd like to share with you the opening of the session. I would like to share his message as a starting to the session. Then in the second part of the talk, I will just shed some light on the uh, on the center, the communication system and, and sensing center. So uh, as we all know that uh, photonics, optics represent the backbone for communication. And it's highlighted as the primary area that enables our societies to be resilient. Our today's forum is co-organized between the center and the e department. We have prominent speakers from international uh, and national institutions uh, that they're going to cover different topics, the three main areas related to photonics and optics, optical communication, optical sensing, and photonics integration. Now, the title for the forum, Optical Communication and Sensing for Next Generation Green and Smart Systems, suggests that the integration between communication and systems. So we expect future systems, designs, networks to be heterogeneous, flexible, intelligent. They are going to fuse both communication and sensing, fusing RF with optics, and the future will be kind of integrated system that covers all. So we have a hub of internet of everything. Machine learning and artificial intelligence, which is a topic that is invading all fields, and photonics is not uh, an exception. Uh, this forum will also shed some light on, on the utilization of machine learning and AI onto these topics. At the kingdom level, at the kingdom Saudi Arabia level, we know that there is vision, vision 2030, and uh, which takes these topics of communication and sensing into account. Now the kingdom of Saudi Arabia is the 10th or among the 10 best university countries in the world when it comes to the fastest internet access. And that's something that we are proud of. And also, uh, as uh, the importance of this topic, there's a new program that's the Saudi Semiconductor Program that is shed some light on, on the use of electronics and optics and manufacturing it locally. So this is at the kingdom level. When it comes to the university, the establishment of the center itself is a sign of the importance of the topic. And we have now a dedicated center for communication systems and sensing that integrates RF and optics into one center. Now, uh, before I proceed and, uh, with the talk, I'd like to thank very much the prominent speakers, Professor Tam, Professor Alan, Professor Habib from Tunisia, and Professor Yatan, one from, uh, from KAUST. We have speakers from Hong Kong, Tunisia, and, and Saudi Arabia. So you are most welcome, and we are happy to have you here with us, and I urge everybody to, to learn from, from this, uh, this forum. I leave later on the session distribution for, for the, Dr. Zag or Dr. Khoram to, to, to explain the, the distribution of the sessions. But I'd like to thank them very much, Dr. Zag and Dr. Khoram, for, for their uh, efforts to make this uh, forum possible. And if I miss anybody also, so uh, then uh, I'd like to thank everybody who is pictures here or, or otherwise. Now, my next part, in a few minutes, just maybe two or three minutes, I'll just shed some light on the center. So. Uh, that will promote collaboration with, with others. Uh, at King Fahd University, we have about 16 centers. And as you can see, the Center for Communication and System is one of them. Uh, we have some sister 
or broader centers, including Center for Smart Mobility Logistics, Center for Intelligent Secure Systems, and others where we have direct collaboration with them. Uh, the center has mission, challenges, targets, uh, right from communication to sensing. And we include sensing uh, signal processing as a tool. Of course, we cover both optics and RF as media for, or spectrum for, for, for performing communication or sensing. Uh, I will share with you the link for the center if you want to read more, just to save the time for the forum, just shedding some light and uh, highlighting the important things. We have experts in communication systems, signal processing, optics, uh, in microwave, radar uh, and localization, control, electronics, and we have some guest evidence. Now, we also cooperate with different ministries, with different institutions within the kingdom and outside, with our communication or sensing related uh, institutions. Uh, two main challenges have been identified by the center, including the challenge which is related to drone, whether drone communication or sensing. Uh, uh, also, Dr. Zahad also is proposing projects related to the use of optics or laser communication between drones. So the one main challenge that the center address is all uh, challenges related to, to uh, the use of drone in communication and sensing. The second one is uh, green sensing and communication, and that relates to the title of the forum, where we try to reduce uh, the emission, we reduce uh, the required power to operate these communication system, system and sensing. And that's uh, why we call it uh, green communication and, and sensing. Now, before I leave you with, with the forum, I just want to stick to, to the time. Uh, I'd like to, to urge everybody who is here to use this opportunity as a network. We have uh, excellent professors here at, at King Cloud University. We have uh, excellent graduate students and postdoc. And we are lucky to have uh, international speakers here with us. So I urge everybody to make use of this opportunity to gain knowledge about optical communication system, photonics, and its importance to our society. And I wish all of you a proud, uh, productive forum. So uh, thank you for giving me the chance for, to be here with you. And I'd like to uh, carry the message of, of, of the BVI, the vice president, his thanks to all of you and his welcome message. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Dr. Adi. Uh, so uh, let's uh, uh, kickstart the forum. So as we uh, know, we have two sessions. So the first session, session one. Uh, I'm stop sharing. Should I stop sharing? Yeah, I think, I think if you can stop sharing. Uh, so we have the first session and I would uh, uh, invite Dr. Uh, Puram Qureshi to take care of the first session in uh, inviting the speakers. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Zahid. Um, so I welcome you all for uh, coming over to this uh, um, KICS um, uh, symposium. Uh, so we have a very distinguished list of uh, panelists and the speakers today with us, and we're, we're really proud of that. So let me uh, first introduce the first speaker, uh, Professor um, H. Y. Tham. Um, so the professor H. Y. Tham received his uh, B.S. and uh, Ph.D. degree in electronic and electronic engineering, electrical and electronic engineering at the University of uh, Manchester, U.K. Uh, later, he joined Hearst uh, Research Center, G.E.C. Marconi Limited, London, working on optical components, fiber laser systems, and erbium dough fiber amplifiers. Uh, Professor Tan then joined the Hong Kong Polytechnic University in 1993 and is currently the chair professor of photonics at the Department of Electrical Engineering and the director of Photonics Research Center um, at the Hong Kong Polytechnic University, where he has established several world-class facilities. Um, his current research interests include uh, fabrication of special optical silica and polymer fibers, and complete optical fiber sensor solutions for various industries, including railways, um, smart buildings, and medicines. Professor Tam has published more than 700 technical papers and been awarded uh, more than 20 patents. Uh, he has extensive uh, research collaboration with many uh, renowned universities around the world. Um, Professor Tam has extensive R&D collaboration with industry as well. And his team has installed many fiber bracketing sensing systems for railways in Hong Kong, mainland of China, 
Singapore, Netherlands, Taiwan, and India. His team built the first uh, citywide fiber optic sensing network based monitoring system of, uh, met, uh, for metro system in Hong Kong and Singapore. Um, Professor Tam has also won numerous international awards for his inventions and is a chartered engineer of the Engineering Council UK, an IEEE fellow and the fellow of Optica. Um, so uh, without further ado, let me um, now uh, present our first distinguished speaker, Professor H.Y. Tam. So inshallah, uh, today he's gonna talk about um, the, uh, the, the title uh, that is from an accidental discovery to AI enabled photonic sensor network. Uh, the floor is yours, Professor Tam. Oh, thank you. Uh, yeah, KK. Uh, let me try to share my. Can you see? Can you see yes. the screen? Yes, we can. Yes. Okay. So, are you seeing the right? You're seeing the uh, slide, yes. right? Yes, we can yes. see. Yes, we can see the slide. Yes. Oh, okay. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. First of all, I'd like to thank you. Uh, uh, Dr. Ali for the uh, warm welcome. And of course, uh, I would also like to uh, thank uh, Dr. Uh, Korat, okay, Karashi for inviting me for this uh, uh, forum. Okay, so uh, I'm uh, S.Y. Tan from the Department of Electrical Engineering of the Hong Kong Polytechnic University. Um, so there are many successful inventions such as uh, implantable pacemaker, post-it notes, and Penicillin were discovered by accident. Now, optical fiber grading sensor technology originated uh, from the accident discovery of photosensitivity in optical fiber. Now, photosensitivity enabled the fabrication of FPG or fiber grade grading sensors in optical fiber. Over the last 30 years or so, FPG sensors have been successfully used in many industries. In this talk, I will present our work in using FPG sensors in the railway industry, where we combine FPG sensor and AI technologies to build predictive uh, maintenance uh, system. Now, I will start with a short story of how photosensitivity in optical fiber was discovered by Professor uh, Ken Hughes lab in Canada. This phenomenon allows FPG sensor to be created inside the core of standard telecom uh, optical fiber, I will briefly explain the unique features of FPG sensors and the uses in many uh, uh, industries. Then I will introduce our work on using large-scale FPG-based sensing system for monitoring railway and uh, building. Now, in an early experiment, Professor Hugh observed that the optical power from an optical fiber decreased after a few minutes. He later set up an experiment as a illustrated in this uh, slide, where a 244 nanometer laser light was launched into a one meter long optical fiber. He measured the transmitted as well as the refracted optical power using two power meter. Uh, let me bring up my laser pointer. Okay, so using uh, an optical power meter at the output and also an optical power meter at the uh, input. Now, after a few minutes, almost all the light was refracted from the fiber, and he observed that a permanent one meter long grating was created inside this optical fiber. Okay. Now, when the fiber is pulled, the refracted wavelength changes with the applied strain. Okay. So the grating could therefore be used as a strain sensor. So, so in fact, he have created uh, by accident. Okay. And uh, permanent grading in the optical fiber. And this is a start of using an FPG uh, a sensor. However, the operation wavelength is restricted to the writing laser wavelength around 244 nanometer. Now, 10 years later, Jared Mels used two laser beams to generate an interference fringe. Okay, as shown here. So this is an optical fiber. So the two beam uh, from uh, 244 uh, nanometer laser, okay, and then split into two beam, and these two beam interfere, 
okay, inside the cone of optical fibers. So this is a one photon process, which is much more efficient than the 488 nanometer two photon process uh, used by um, Ken Hill. Now this process is much more efficient and you can write an FBJ in an optical fiber in just a few seconds. Uh, more importantly, FPGs of any operating wavelength can be fabricated using this technique. The photograph in the center show the core and optical fiber here, where an optical F and uh, where an FPG was inscribed. Now, commercial FPGs are normally fabricated using the face mask technique, as shown in this figure on the right. Now, this is a much more repeatable process and high precision optical alignment is not required when you're using this face mask to write a grating inside the core of fiber. Now the grating of the face mask is imprinted inside the fiber core using this uh, UV uh, laser light. The fringe pattern in the FPG here, okay, is half of the face mask grating pitch. Therefore we can write an FPG of any wavelength uh, using face mask of the appropriate uh, grading pitch. Now this cartoon shows how FPG can be used as temperature or strain sensor. The typical strain and temperature coefficient of FPGs in standard optical fiber are one picometer per micro strain, or you, if you want to use it for measuring temperature, it is 10 picometer per degree centigrade. Okay. And um, so this simple equation, okay, determine the refractive wavelength or what we call the bread wavelength, okay, when the uh, refractive index in the fiber core or, or, or the FPG change or the period of the FPG uh, changes. So this uh, animation show that when you, okay, apply strain to the FPG, then the refractive wavelength uh, changes uh, as indicated by the different color. Now, one of the main advantages of this uh, particular type of uh, sensor is that all other wavelengths will be transmitted without any loss. So you can easily fabricate many um, FPG along a single fiber, as long as you make sure that those F all these FPG in along a single fiber reflect a different wavelength. And you could use all these FPG to measure different uh, uh, parameter. So FPG is sensitive to temperature, as I said before, is sensitive to strain but you can also through some smart material or transducer um, to convert an FPG to measure acceleration, vibration, or even CO2 gas. Now, FPG sensor have been successfully used in many industries. Some of the early applications are in oil gas, aircraft, and large structures such as bridges and tall buildings. Um, so let's uh, look at the, um, uh, the tower on the right. So this is the Canton Tower in uh, Guangzhou, China, where in uh, 10 years ago, we installed a structural health monitoring system, okay? The entire system actually consists of about 1,000 sensors, but they include 120 FPG sensors, which monitor stress, vibration, acceleration, and inclination, okay? So just using fiber optic sensor, I mean, FPG sensor, we can measure all these uh, different uh, parameters of the 610 meter tall building. Now, more recently, FPG are used uh, to investigate for their potential application in battery monitoring here, okay? So this is the work that I started about five years ago, uh, collaborating with uh, a few international groups where we're trying, where we actually use the FPG sensor. Uh, now, this FPG sensor actually make a specialized uh, optical fiber where we actually fabricate the fiber in, in, in my lab. And then uh, using this special fiber, uh, some of the fiber are made of polymer, some are made of silica, and then we fabricate grating in there. Now, the idea is we actually use the sensor, we put it inside the, uh, the battery. When we use the, during, uh, uh, when, the up, uh, when, the, when the battery are in use, we can actually monitor all these chemical and physical processes happening inside the battery, okay? And that actually allow us to uh, predict the aging of a battery. So we published a, a, a paper in that. 
uh, and that will become, uh, um, uh, I think, uh, uh, attract a lot of interest because uh, battery manufacturer, they would like to know whenever they develop a new type of battery, they would like to know about the, the age, uh, the lifetime of the battery. And, and using this technique, we're able to sort of like predict the lifetime of battery. And also um, recently we use uh, we develop a, a special type of um, a fiber and then we make FPG and we use it to uh, uh, monitor like the power sweep. Okay, from the power sweep, uh, this is actually a project I collaborated with uh, a, a university in Japan. Using the single FPG sensor, uh, we are able to uh, determine the pulse rate, temperature, respiration rate, uh, pressure, and even the uh, breast sugar level. So, so, so just attaching it on the surface of, a, of the skin is it, able to give you all this solid vital information. Yeah. We also use it to build robotic scheme and uh, we use it to uh, monitor the lift and escalator. Okay, I'll talk more about that later. Now, FPG sensors offer many unique advantages. I listed three of the most important ones here. Uh, and that allow the construction of an integrated large scale sensing system. The first one is a multi-point and multi-parameter that is allowing many sensors on a single optical fiber to measure different parameters as shown in the figures. And this is very difficult to do if you're trying to uh, build one using conventional sensors. Now different measurement uh, would be required to measure a different type of pa parameter. If you're using like a, a MEM sensor or other type of uh, electronic sensor, and then you have a difficulty of integrating all these different type of sensor from different manufacturer into a single system. And that can be very difficult or very expensive to implement. Now, FPG sensor uh, EMI in mu and no power is needed, okay, to uh, power the sensors, uh, nor the sensor network. Uh, electrical power is only required by the interrogator. FPG sensors and optical fiber have very long lifetime and a very low maintenance cost. And that's why we, we think that the FPG sensing network is actually is a very green technology. A large photonic sensing network permits large amount of high quality and reliable data to be collected. This is not possible or extremely costly, as I said, if you're trying to use conventional sensor. And for example, electrical signal over long distances can be very noisy and then you need a shielding. Okay? So the application of machine learning to big data and domain expert with a domain expert produce meaningful information. We have been collaborating very closely with railway experts for more than 20 years. We use the data obtained from FPG installed on rail track to generate health index, which is related to the health condition of the trains. So, so this is a sensor installed on the rail track, okay, to monitor all the passing train along that rail track. Now the health index provides useful information and knowledge of the train. I will give some uh, example um, uh, in the uh, later slides, okay. So we have installed FPG sensing network in Hong Kong and Singapore to monitor the health of all the trains tra traveling on five metro lines in Hong Kong, as shown here, okay? So, uh, so this is uh, referred to the smart railway uh, system, okay, where we install. This actually monitor this entire line. Now, so we, we, we don't have to install FPG sensor along uh, the entire length, okay? What we have done is uh, we, identify a good section, okay? So this is around maybe about a 30 meter uh, region. And then we install FPG sensor there. So every single train that pass through this metro line, we're able to monitor, okay? The health condition of the train. So it's a very effective uh, approach. So we have installed one system here and one here. So all together we have installed five systems in Hong Kong and, and, and they actually monitor, I think probably about 80% or over 80% of all the Metro train in Hong Kong. And uh, in uh, 2017, so five, six years, or about five or six years ago, we actually also installed two systems in Singapore, SMRT, okay? Uh, actually 
on two of the oldest line. One is this, the so-called north-south line, okay? And the other one is the east, east-west line, okay? So, so that's the complete system that we install uh, in Singapore. So, so only this that require electricity. And then we have optical power going out from our interrogator to the different, okay, metro, uh, I mean, different part of the rail track. Yeah. So we have installed FPG on the rail track to measure the interaction between the track and the views of the passing train to actually get the health index of every single train that passing on that particular line. Now, this slide show the health index of an egg, egg the coach train uh, measure over the two years period. So, so this figure on the bottom right actually show you the health index of one of the train, okay, for over two years, okay. This is actually uh, December 2014 all the way to uh, December 2016. Now, the red and the black dot represent the health index on the left and right side of the train, okay? Every single um, uh, coaches, every single coach are measured, okay? So, so on, the, on the left here, it actually what we have developed, uh, we developed this uh, color code system. When it's green, that means it's okay. Yellow, that means the health index is getting unhealthy. When it's red, that means it's very serious. Then uh, we'll inform the railway operator and then they have to look at this trend and then we also show them where is the possible problem or which uh, I mean which critical component um, on the trend give you the problem yeah now the health index if the value of the health index increase that means the trend uh, getting unhealthy as can be seen by here so over one year okay so the health index value on the left and the right side and uh, starting from about 0.5 and then go up to about uh, 4.5 and 5, okay. When you get to that level, then the railway operator have to uh, take the train back to the depot and then do maintenance. And after maintenance, as you can see from here, when after the maintenance, they put the train back to the um, uh, service and our sensing system, okay, immediately detect the improvement in the health index, okay. So, so we have obtained, I don't know, maybe a, many thousands of uh, data like this and, and the accuracy is actually 100%. So what I meant is that every time they have done some uh, maintenance on the train and they put back on the track and our system always show that there is an improvement, significant improvement in the health uh, condition of the track. So, so this become a very useful system, maintenance system, because every single coach, we have this information. So, so that means the railway operator can, can use this information and then predict the methods and schedule the next uh, maintenance. So, so we have built the world first predicted maintenance system for railway based on FPG sensing technology, using FPG sensor, sensor on the rail track to monitor the health condition of train. And we also install FPG uh, system on the train to made, measure the condition of overhead line and uh, rail track. Now the graph on the left, okay, show the rail condition along one entire metro line. Okay, so this is uh, show you the uh, health condition of the rail track along this. I think this is about maybe uh, 36 kilometer, okay. And then this system actually also use a color code when it's green is okay, when it's uh, yellow, okay. So that's mean the, uh, you start having this or uh, like a corrugation as shown here, okay. And, and, and this is common. So as the track is being used and gradually the corrugation develop, okay. Now the interesting about this result is that now we you can actually, now normally this is, uh, this is actually inspected by a visual inspection. So you have a technician, okay, maybe during nighttime and then walk around the, the track. And when they identify this and it's too serious, then uh, they were trying to sort of like um, 
uh, schedules or like a polishing uh, uh, um, um, a routine, okay, to actually smooth out the surface. Yeah. But what we have seen in this particular incident, we can also, our system is also able to take uh, the sleeper hot spot, okay? And, and this is not able to actually uh, um, uh, observe by a technician, okay? But our system is able to tell us, and this can be quite serious because when you have a sleeper that is hot, so that means the vibration is very serious and that can cause uh, quicker degradation of your trend. I I see that I only have about one minute left, right? So I'm trying to rush through this. And, uh, and later on during the discussion, uh, if you want minutes. to ask me a question, we can always go back. Yeah. So the overhead line, uh, we actually collaborated about se seven years ago with uh, Ricardo Rail in the UK, and we instrumented a single train. Okay, we put sensor on the pentagraph, and uh, we measure the contact force here. Okay, so they actually show here uh, the contact force on this graph. And then we also show the result, uh, the system also able to show the contact position. So when that contact, when you see it's moving like left, right, left, right, the contact point, this can be observed here. Yeah. So the idea is we want to make sure that the contact point between, uh, this is where the pentagraph collect current, okay, from the overhead line. We want to make sure that the contact point never actually move outside that, so like plus or minus 300 millimeter, okay? One is gone outside there. So this is um, the, um, the carbon collector is only limited from uh, plus 300 to uh, negative 300 millimeter, okay? And, and the contact force, they want to uh, make sure that it's not too small and it's not too large. If the contact force is too large, then that means you wear out the overhead line very quickly, and it's very expensive to change the overhead line. So this is a very effective uh, system, and um, and uh, that actually uh, the uh, result on the right. What uh, I'm trying to show you is uh, this is an incident that happened uh, also in that year, 2015. So from the city center to uh, the airport in the Netherlands, so the Schiphol Airport is a very busy airport. And after we completed our experiment, and then a, a month later, there's an overhead line uh, actually broke. Uh, and that actually caused a, a serious disruption to the uh, passenger who's trying to catch a plane, obviously. And when we look back to our, our result, because we can actually see that four weeks before the incident happened, you can see it's, it's very clear. And then three weeks, okay, before it happened, that particular contact force increased significantly. So, so that means this system using FBG is able to predict, okay, before an overhead line break. Yeah, three or four weeks uh, in advance. And uh, most recently, we actually uh, using the same approach and uh, working with uh, a number of uh, international lift and escalator company, we have to develop this system, okay? So this is a system that also uh, can do a predictive uh, uh, maintenance. And uh, so it's quite, quite a mature system now. We have uh, actually over the last two, three years, uh, we have installed over 100 systems in Hong Kong. And uh, we even have uh, this sort of app, okay? So you can, you can I mean, the, uh, the owner or the technician can have access to know the health of the each individual lift or escalator. So all these are useful information. If there's something wrong, okay? Or before uh, something wrong happened, uh, this can actually, uh, this system can actually uh, alert them. Now, Hong Kong has about 80,000 lift and escalator. It's probably uh, one of the most, uh, I think, uh, city with the highest uh, number of lift and escalator. And each of the lift and escalator are required by law in Hong Kong, okay, to inspect every two weeks. So that's been, you could it require a lot of uh, maintenance work. And our system is able to uh, reduce this uh, amount of maintenance work uh, significantly. So this is a result. 
So the white dotted line is indicate every two, two weeks, okay? So the result show the health condition of all the step roller of an escalator, okay? From like the first roller in this particular, if you look at the, uh, the photo on your right, it show the, uh, the step, okay? These are the step roller. So this is, this is a step roller. So our system is measuring the health condition of every single roller. So if you look at the step roller number 44, okay, green mean healthy, okay? So first inspection, second inspection, third inspection, fourth, and so on. So our system shows that there's no problem until around mid-September, okay? You start seeing this are like a, it turn into like a yellow and then turn into red. And then the technician observed that and changed it and our system showed that and then it go back into green. So, so the seven white dotted line are the days when inspection were conducted. The results shown that at least the previous six inspections are not needed. Okay, so, so our system can definitely help to save a lot of manpower. Now, FPG sensor technology processes many efficient features for large scale sensor system, and is an ideal candidate for building the nervous system of a smart city. This include immunity to EMI, high bandwidth, and distributed sensing capability. So it's able to measure different uh, physical and chemical parameter. It is a very green technology because optical fiber sensing system use minimum material, okay, to build a city-wide monitoring system and no electricity is required as I mentioned before. And another interesting um, uh, uh, feature is a future proof because you can upgrade a FPG sensing system easily. All you need to do is you make sure that you attach a, a um, FPG sensor. So, but make sure that the FPG do not or they do not actually uh, uh, have the same wavelength as the existing uh, FPG. I think. I think one example is um, uh, particularly interesting is um, the recent strong uptake of EV, and that will result in the availability of terawatt hours of used battery because EV batteries, after it's been used, and if it's only if it left about eighty percent of capacity, and you can't use it for EV. Okay, so you're talking about a lot of energy storage potential for use. Okay, of the second life battery. Um, like 10 or 15 years from now. So an effective optical fiber monitoring system for used battery will become important in a smart city to ensure the reliability and safety of second life battery. So in summary, the amazing capability of FPG sensor to measure multitudes of uh, physical, chemical, and biological parameter over long distances allowed the realization of large scale sensing network. And it provides an important green technology for smart city monitoring system. So that's my last slide, I think. Uh, thank you, Professor thank Tam. You. Thank you, Professor Tam, for such a nice talk. Uh, um, so is there any questions by the participants? If you have any questions, you can put it in the Q&A chat box. Okay, so we have a question. Um, so the question is from Muhammad Al Mubarak. He's saying, uh, "What AI model was used for prediction? Did you consider using graph?" Okay. Now, what what we have used is uh, now we um, we developed this uh, health index based on the um, measure result from all the FPG sensor. Okay. Now. So, so basically what we have done is uh, we actually use the um, amplitude and then we also look at the uh, frequency content of this uh, interaction uh, between, for example, the sensor we install on the rail track. So, so the FPG sensor is actually measuring the interaction between the wheel and the rail track, okay? Now, from the FPG sensor, uh, the data, we sort of like, uh, as I said, you look at the amplitude and the frequency, and then we, we uh, working with the railway engineer, and uh, we derive a help index. Now, how we, we derive the help index, that, that obviously is a commercial <laughs> a secret. 
And then based on the health index, okay, and we use uh, this uh, machine learning algorithm to detect the abnormality of, of, of this health index. Now, because the amount of health index that we generate, well, the amount of uh, data we get from FPG uh, from every single day is about 1 billion. So there, there, there's, a, there's a huge amount of data. Yeah. So, so the machine learning that we use is actually quite simple. Okay, just to detect the uh, abnormal uh, health index. Um, actually, I have an example that I, I didn't actually show just now. So as I mentioned uh, before, in a, in a normal trend, the health index of the left and the right, okay, should behave similarly. Now, we have, we have learned that if the left and right are, are behaving, okay, differently, then there's something wrong with the, uh, what we call the real balance of the trend. And this is a not a, a, a desirable uh, uh, a feature of a trend. Okay. And then we can also, now there, there are different behavior of the uh, health index that indicate the different problem of a trend. Yeah. So, so using machine learning, we're able to learn that. Thank you. So, Thank so we, we, did, we basically just look at the um, um, abnormality of this health index and then the behavior of this uh, health index. Yeah. Now, the behavior of, of the health index, and uh, if there's some uh, problem with a different critical component of the trend, then the behavior of the health index are different. So, so basically, what we have used the machine learning is very simple because the machine learning actually learned the different behavior of the health index. Okay, and then correlate that with the actual incident that happened. Thank you, thank you, Professor Tan. Thank you, Professor Tan, for your answer. So uh, let us move to the next speaker. Um, so our next speaker is Professor Alan Pakta Lau. Uh, Professor Lau obtained the BASc in Engineering Science and MASc in Electrical and Computer Engineering from the University of Toronto in 2003 and 2004, respectively. Uh, he then obtained his PhD degree in Electrical Engineering at the Stanford University in 2008. Uh, he was the recipient of numerous government awards during his postgraduate studies at the Stanford University. Um, he also worked at NEC Labs um, in America in 2006 as a research associate in optical networking division. Um, uh, he, he later joined the electrical engineering department in fall of 2008, where he's a full professor. Um, his research interests include uh, system design and signal processing techniques for coherent fiber optic communication systems and multimode fiber communication systems. Um, Professor Lau is a senior member of IEEE and uh, OSA uh, called Optica now and serves as a reviewer for many prominent journals, including Optics Express, IEEE Transaction of Wireless Communications and uh, Transaction of Communication. Um, so let us uh, welcome uh, Professor Lau. So the floor is your Professor Lau. Hello, uh, Dr. Karishi, can you hear me? Yeah, we can, yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you. Uh, let me try to make sure I can share the screen. Uh, are you seeing the screen? Yeah. Yeah, we can. Thank you. Okay. Good. Good. Thank you, Dr. Kureshi, for your uh, kind invitation and introduction. Thank you, the uh, organizing committee, uh, for this opportunity um, to share with you uh, some of the work that we have done in recent years, particularly um, in uh, the machine learning applications. Um, so today, I like to... Uh, I extend a little bit and talk in more general terms uh, how machine learning is applied in uh, various places in optical communications and networks. Um, so let's start by talking about you know uh, some basics. Uh, what is machine learning? So um, so by now I guess uh, everyone uh, knows about machine learning at least, at least qualitatively. So uh, basically it is to train machines, algorithms, computers to learn from data without being explicitly programmed. Okay? Uh, fundamentally, uh, it is about pattern recognition. Uh, there are typically two types. Uh, one type we call data classification. So given two class of data, you know, how do you distinguish them? 
Uh, another type is regression, okay, basically of fitting a curve. Okay. Um, machine learning generally performs exceptionally well, okay, particularly when you cannot really explicitly describe the underlying physics or mathematics of the problem that you are interested in. So I, I do communications, um, and I like to argue that um, uh, um, before this wave of uh, interest in machine learning, which you know sort of is a big thing since you know ten years ago, um, we we are always uh, doing uh, classifications and regressions to some degree. Okay, so for classifications, um, the standard um, in a communicant in a standard communicant setup, we always have received signal that we we need we need to decide whether a bit one or a bit zero is transmitted. Okay, so we do this sort of decisions uh, all the time. So what you see here is a, a standard what we call QPSK constellation. It conveys two bits. Um, Regression, we also do this all the time. Um, any time when you have to estimate any parameter of a channel or, or uh, uh, some parameters that describe um, a block of signals, okay? In here is example of uh, how we typically uh, estimate the phase of the lasers, okay? Um, and so, so these sort of process are essentially are curve fitting, okay? So it is regression. So, um, the the point here is that uh, a lot of the stuff in communications, not just optical, general communications, uh, have involved classifications and regression. Okay, long time ago, before anyone talked about machine learning, and so therefore, uh, one of the important things that we need, we felt we need to highlight is, uh, first of all, what kind of uh, problems um, in modern day uh, optical communication networks that really need uh, machine learning beyond the classical, uh, beyond the typical uh, classification or regressions. So I'd like to provide um, some uh, simple examples to illustrate the point. Uh, let's say we just talk about classification. Okay, so let's say you have this sort of uh, uh, data. Okay, so to classify them, um, it's pretty straightforward. Okay, so the, the, this red line is the decision boundary. Okay, so you don't call that machine learning. Okay, uh, if your data looks like that, uh, your classification boundaries uh, uh, would look like this straight slanted line. Okay, in terms of the algebra, what you actually do is you have to x and y coordinate. Okay, what you do is you actually um, rotate your coordinates and translate. You know, put the red line, uh, shift it towards the origin. Okay, and then you make a decision. So mathematically, this is a matrix W times x plus b, and then you do a decision on it. Okay, in a machine learning language, you call it activation function, but essentially the idea is decision. Okay, um, you still don't call it a, a neural network. All right. However, if you have a problem that looks like this, okay, so what happens is that you have your x and y coordinates, and then so you first pass through this red decision line, okay, and then you pass through this blue decision line. Now, what you want to extract is the green portion. And then, so what you do is you actually have an additional layer of decision to sort of single out this green area. Now, it is this sort of problem that naturally uh, is a, it's a, resembles the simplest sort of uh, uh, machine learning structure. In fact, the, the most um, common uh, artificial neural network uh, structure. Okay, so the point here is that um, the, the problem that you need to deal with has to be at least this complex in order for you to uh, to 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 bring out machine learning okay um so now coming back to now uh, with, with that in mind now uh, i want to come back to uh, communications and networks okay um what sort of problems in optical communication networks will need machine learning uh typically there are two types okay it's a type first type is when we cannot explicitly statistically characterize the input output relationship or when the solution space is too big uh, to evaluate one by one. Um, so that's the general idea. Now, in more specific terms, here are the few areas uh, that we have seen a lot of machine learning activities. First, it's uh, what we call 
uh, non-linearity compensation. So the, the idea is the fiber channel is not a linear uh, system. It's a non-linear system. So in that case, you cannot really throw all the uh, standard communications uh, uh, knowledge uh, into the in, into a fiber channel. Okay? You need something uh, more sense, more um, uh, uh, complicated. Another area is called optical performance monitoring. Okay, so the idea is to extract a small part of the signal somewhere along the network, and you try to infer the state of the of the signal, whether you have it has a good uh, signal to noise ratio or or able to uh, estimate some link parameters based on this um, small extraction of the signal. In a more network um, area, um, people are using machine learning to try to monitor um, the different parts of a network to sort of um, hopefully extract some uh, fault detection uh, so that you can do prevention. So this is quite universal. You, the, the philosophy, the idea is the same as the train monitoring that you have just heard by Professor Tam. So the idea is you use machine learning to monitor different parts of the stuff that you are interested in and then try to extract uh, warning signals before a major disaster happens. So that is um, exactly the same philosophically uh, in optical network management. Um, <clears throat> and then uh, a more active take on such capabilities is to have what we call dynamic uh, network uh, configuration where you real time monitor the network state and then you put the higher speed signal uh, that caters for the real time neural condition to maximize the capacity. Okay, so I'll talk about uh, these four these four areas briefly uh, in the remaining the time that I that I have. Um, so I first talk about fiber nonlinear compensation. So this is something that we have done um, like more than ten years ago. Uh, we like to argue this, this is probably the first work uh, on using machine learning. Uh, on, um, on on fiber nonlinear compensation. So the idea is uh, you have some received 100 gig received signal, QPSK signal transmitted over a long distance. Okay, uh, so you recover the signal first, and then what you do is you first um, compensate the linear impairments um, in, in fiber. The linear impairments is typically a dispersion, chromatic dispersion. Okay, afterwards you put that into uh, we put that into a neural network. Okay, uh, and so basically, it's a very simple one layer uh, artificial neural network, one sorry, one hidden layer artificial neural network. And then the, the graph here uh, are the uh, performance results. Uh, so basically, it is a Q factor versus launch power. The Q factor is a measure of a signal quality. And you can see that uh, our method, of course, outperforms the case when you don't try to. Uh, tackle the nonlinear effects. Okay, it is also comparable to a standard um, non-machine learning technique called digital backpropagation that tries to uh, undo the nonlinear effect. So the advantage here is that uh, the machine learning uh, approach uh, can give a performance similar to the best uh, algorithm out there, but yet it is actually a lot simpler computationally. So since then, there has been a lot of other works that also try to tackle the problem uh, from different angles. Okay, so there are work by a group in US, um, another group, uh, another work by a group in, uh, in Europe that tries to use different types of machine learning methods to try to, to come up with um, uh, uh, highly specific decision boundaries uh, for uh, high-speed signals uh, that have undergone some uh, nonlinear effects. So you can see that your received signal distribution is quite distorted. That's because of the fiber nonlinearity. And because of that, uh, it naturally calls for some machine learning techniques to try to develop the best sort of curve decision boundaries to uh, uh, maximize the performance in measure in terms of the bit error ratio. And in fact, uh, there are works that try to model this whole um, uh, nonlinear compensation algorithm as a big neural network. So in, in this area of optical communications, all these uh, approach to try to mitigate fiber nonlinearity, uh, which 
we can see this whole algorithm as a neural network. And in that case, we try to optimize all these parameters using standard machine learning techniques. Okay, so um, there are uh, different groups, including our group, that uh, sort of shows how um, how much you can improve your performance by just taking uh, a standard algorithm uh, for nonlinear compensation, view it as a neural network, and then use the standard machine learning tools to try to uh, learn all the parameters. Okay, um, and so uh, besides fiber nonlinearity. Um, there's also other types of nonlinearity in optical communications. Uh, for example, the oldest type, type of um, uh, optical communications is what we call intensity modulated direct detection, IMDD. Okay? So that itself, uh, it's also a nonlinear channel. Okay? So there are another bunch of work that tries to uh, apply machine learning techniques to try to see how do you best design your signals, how do you best detect uh, your signal um, using machine learning techniques. Okay, so typically, uh, what people have found out is that uh, uh, these machine learning techniques generally uh, would give you a performance that is comparable to 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 the lit literature, uh, but they are generally uh, simpler computationally. Okay, uh, and this is a very hot uh, ongoing area uh, uh, with uh, lots of new ideas in every conference every year. Now, another um, application areas of machine learning in optical communication and networks, it's this thing called optical performance monitoring. So long story short, the idea is um, you extract a small part of signal somewhere along the network, and you want to monitor the health or the status of the signal and the link. Right? So basically, you get a small part of the signal, and I want to know all the, uh, the, the signal power, the signal noise ratio, these physical parameters, uh, dispersion, proportional mode dispersion, and then all the wavelength shifting, everything that you want that you can possibly extract. Okay. Um, and so this is originally intended for um, ensuring the network is operating reliably. Okay. Uh, but uh, these days, we also take that in a more active role to try to um, tailor a custom uh, um, provision or custom made um, light path. Uh, you put some light path uh, on the network that is uh, specifically uh, tailored for the, the channel condition at that moment. Okay. Um, so, to just give you a quick example of uh, how difficult it is. Um, uh, if we don't do use machine learning. So one of the uh, simplest or typical uh, system setup uh, for this uh, application is that you, 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 have, you can extract the signal amplitudes uh, using some low speed component. Okay? You can have a distribution uh, of, of, of all these signal amplitudes. And then the task here, it's I want to extract what is the signal noise ratio and all these other physical parameters. Okay? So, just if you wanted to, um, if you wanted to do this job analytically, it is pretty much impossible just from this distribution and map to this data. Okay, but if you do a bit more uh, empirical work, you can sort of see how you know you, the, each of these physical parameters. Okay, somewhat depends on the different order moments. The first order moment is the mean of the mean. The second order moment is kind of a variance third and fourth order moment, it actually somewhat depends on different moments of this distribution, okay? And so we don't know, or it's hard to derive how to, how, how to map these physical parameters with the empirical moments, okay? Um, and this is why it is a very standard setup for machine learning. Okay, so you know that there is some dependence between the empirical moments and the parameters that you want to measure, but you cannot really analytically derive it. So that's exactly the, the perfect setup to use uh, neural networks. Okay, that is what we have tried to do. Um, so the input of a neural network is the empirical moments obtained uh, empirically, and then I want to map it to the physical parameters that I wanted. Okay. Uh, and we can show that you know, this way of doing things, we are able to achieve a very good accuracies. And the point here is that this is something that, that probably you are not 
most likely you're not able to do analytically starting from this empirical distribution is virtually impossible and that is why uh, machine learning have found a good uh, application in this area now and since uh, since our work uh, there's also a lot of other approaches uh, to try to use other uh, 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 features of this optical signal to learn um, the parameters uh, we've used applicable histograms there are people who use the eye diagram as input there are people who actually use a signal spectra as input there are people who try to use the, the whole coherent detector signal as input to try to map these inputs with the physical parameters okay and so this is again another area that that we see a lot of uh, machine learning activities okay so now let's switch gear to talk a bit more about networks okay um so in optical networks um uh, a lot of people talk about you know, uh, future networks need to be uh, intelligent, autonomous, and dynamic. Okay, uh, there's a lot of um, uh, terminologies to describe the same thing: right? software-defined networks, uh, automatic switch optical networks, zero-touch networks, meaning you don't have to have uh, any manual intervention. The whole thing can learn, uh, monitor, and learn itself. Okay? Big data analytics, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Okay, uh, so these sort of areas, uh, things has been talked about for decades okay? but then nowadays uh, with machine learning uh, we are one step closer because machine learning can help in the following way forecast traffic patterns okay so that you can have a better resource allocation uh, and then um, intelligently commission light paths uh, incorporating the real-time physical layer uh, condition to maximize the network throughput uh, and then again as we briefly mentioned just now predict physical link conditions for corrective fault detection. So real-time monitor the, 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 the condition of system. And then you know, when you start to not behave, you immediately address the problem uh, so that uh, you, you can ensure the network is operating correctly. So in this aspect, um, generally uh, one of the big uh, enabler for this whole grand vision is to build some applications uh, in the network monitoring software uh, to try to estimate the um, what we call the quality of transmission of a particular link. Okay, so for example, I have a new uh, uh, connection request. I wanted to know uh, whether this path can have a good signal to noise ratio, or whether that path uh, is not good enough, or whether this third path uh, uh, have a good enough or bad enough uh, signal to noise ratio to support this uh, uh, new request. Okay, so we call this quality of transmission. Um, so generally the way you do it is uh, you, you, you take the input, the, the input of your QOT estimation, it's some link level parameters, like how many links you have, the length of your connection, uh, and then the, uh, the, the, the amplifier parameters, uh, and then the uh, so on and so forth, okay? Um, and so, so the idea is, you know, again, you have this input features uh, that mostly coming from the, the, the link description, and then you want to map to an output. Uh, either, you know, it tells you whether uh, the, uh, the supported SNL can uh, support this, this connection request, or it outputs the estimated SNL of the, the channel at hand. Okay, so this again um, sounds like a standard uh, machine learning sort of uh, neural network sort of setup. Okay, and so there are a lot of people who work on it. Uh, this, uh, what we're showing here, is a group uh, in Portugal that tries to uh, uh, study different sort of uh, uh, neural network topologies. And then the idea is uh, you have these uh, link input features as input. Okay, and then um, the output is to uh, to see how accurate it is to uh, correctly determine whether the output has the enough SNL to support uh, this connection request. Okay. Um, and so we also try to make some comparison. Uh, we, we did a comparison between, you know, using analytical models and machine learning, right? Because these sort of areas is a sort of gray area uh, in terms of, um, of determining uh, whether uh, 
machine learning approach is better or traditional approach better. So uh, both approaches will have their uh, pros and cons. Uh, and then so we have shown uh, in more detail, you know, uh, uh, which conditions would favor machine learning, which condition would favor analytical models. Okay, so uh, it's always a trade-off between you know um, how much accuracy you need about your parameter, your, your channel parameters, uh, and then you know the computational complexity, uh, how uh, complete your theoretical model is, uh, whether you have the right data set to train your machine learning if you want to go machine learning, uh, or uh, also you know, even if you have a good trained machine learning model, uh, how confident are you to that this model can work in some other links or some other networks. Okay, um, so so all these stuff are still ongoing discussion in the field and it's still a very active area. Now, lastly, um, with all these um, uh, advances in trying to uh, real time monitor and estimate the uh, channel quality of uh, networks, the last step is to actually uh, 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 provision or build or start new connections based on the, 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 the actual real-time monitored channel quality. And this is uh, one of our joint work with University of Bristol uh, back in a few years ago. It's the first field trial demonstration of uh, using machine learning in real deployed networks, okay? So the idea uh, is, again, you, your input is some link parameters, and then the output is the estimated uh, uh, signal noise ratio of the link, okay? And then based on uh, your estimated signal noise ratio, then we transmit different type of signal with different bit rates. Okay, and so this is a, a field trial, real demonstration of how we can actually make that happen in practice. Uh, and, and since then, there has been um, a lot of other trials uh, to try to um, step by step make this a reality. Um, so lastly. Um, so uh, we talk about a little bit about proactive salt failure. Okay, so the idea uh, is that we can um, actually uh, use machine learning uh, monitor different uh, link components. For example, monitor the the input current of uh, optical amplifier or the uh, the inputs of um, uh, uh, um, uh, the input current, and then also the temperature of the different components, and see if this if things are starting to you know, go outside their normal operating range, and then in that case, recognize the problem before major uh, problems um, appear in the network, okay? So in this area, we talk about uh, what we call proactive fault management, okay? Whether you can detect something is starting to, to, be, to, to, to be problematic, whether you can detect um, uh, it is something that is imminent or some or some problems that are slowly degrading and degrading. Uh, we talk about whether you can localize or find out where exactly the problem is. And then uh, finally, what exactly is the problem? Okay, so I'll just give one uh, one, one example of a work done by a, a Ever Networks a company in Europe. So you can just monitor <coughs> the receive optical power. Okay, and then when they go when, when, when they go away from this to the typical value, <coughs> depending on the trajectory of the uh, the power uh, evolution, you can actually classify there are different type of problem. So, for example, if it suddenly goes out and comes back down, it is one type of problems. If it is growing going up slowly and then coming down abruptly, that's another type of problems. And they were able to sort of learn. Um, from these um, power uh, wave pow power waveform evolution uh, to map to uh, different types of problem, and then they will be able to identify the problems uh, up to 96 hour in advance. And so that actually is a big advantage for network management. Okay. Um, yeah. And so um, lastly, so I just want to make a point saying that. Um, uh, in a lot of application of machine learning, uh, um, the, prop, the the important point is actually to find the right data for training, uh, less about finding the right model. Because in the computer science community, most of the focus is on developing better and better models. But then when you apply to some particular disciplines of engineering and science, a lot of times the more important thing is to find the right uh, data. The model itself uh, might, not be, might not need to be that fancy. 
Um, and yeah, and so um, I think I'd like to conclude by saying, you know, uh, this area of open communications, uh, it is you know, a com combination of a lot of uh, solid physics foundations and also a lot of uh, math. Okay, so machine learning, uh, it, it's not a it's not a game changer, um, but it is actually a good complement to a lot of stuff that we uh, already know from the underlying physics. Okay, so it, we are seeing more and more of these applications of machine learning uh, in all different types of uh, areas in, in communication and networks. Um, and so again, uh, there are a few areas that we talk about, nonlinear transmissions, performance monitoring, uh, physically aware, dynamic life provisioning, fault detection, and there's another area, uh, channel coding, that we uh, are not able to talk with the limited time. Um, and so in the physical layer, this uh, area, um, a lot of times these machine learning uh, algorithms are alternative to uh, existing algorithms. Uh, and then we are try still trying to learn how well you can uh, apply to different settings and how well you can save the computational time. Uh, for network layer, <clears throat> we sort of see its potential, um, but um, the, the, the integration of uh, good model and good data set for training uh, is something that uh, uh, people are still working on, okay? Um, so I'd like to conclude here. Thank you for your time. Uh, we'll be happy to take some questions if there are. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Lau, for your presentation. Uh, we have a question from Muhammad Al-Mubarak. Uh, he's asking, when performing machine learning modeling for compensation, <laughs> is it necessary to continuously feed new data to retain the model since the behavior may change as a result of different factors? Yes, um, so uh, so far, uh, the majority of the machine learning studies for, um, for compensation, uh, it's on static environments uh, where uh, you're trying to compensate some static uh, effects. Um, for dynamic effects, Right now, um, the approach is to try to still tackle the dynamic effects using conventional ways. Uh, because again, uh, one of the um, features of applying machine learning in optical communications is that the optical communication or communication in general, uh, it is built on a lot of uh, solid math and physics. So we actually, have a lot of tools to tackle those um, th th those impairments. So it is it is it, so the question becomes uh, how do you best combine the machine learning, the new sort of thinking with the existing the, the traditional approach, which are which are actually very very high performing. So you can you cannot just discard like like half a century of work on those traditional algorithms. It's more about how you can best combine um, the, the, the traditional thinking with the new tools. So at this moment, the dynamic stuff, it is still more convenient and, and more approachable to um, use the traditional methods. And then you combine it with the machine learning stuff. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Lau. Uh, thank you. Thank so you. Uh, let's thank our speakers now. And uh, with this, we conclude the first session of our symposium. Um, and we move on to the next session now. And uh, Dr. Zahid will chair the next session. So over to you, Dr. Zahid. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Puram. Uh, so uh, let's kick start our second session. So we have our first speaker of the second session, Professor Habib uh, Fatada. Uh, Professor Habib, he got the PhD degree in electrical and computer engineering from Laval University, Canada in 2001. And he currently holds several teaching and research positions in electrical and computer engineering with Laval University. He was here in King South University and currently he is in Carthage University, Tunisia. And uh, he was the founder and the CEO of uh, Access Photonic Networks in early 2000. And the co-founder and the executive director of CACTS TIC for the E-Society, RFTronics from 2010 to 2017. And now currently he is the founder of Idea Laboratory, University of Carthage, and professor of uh, EC with the University of Carthage. 
and he is the senior member of IEEE. So welcome, Professor Habib, you know, and uh, uh, he's going to give us a talk or a sort of shedding light on the wave and the medium engineering driven by human and or artificial intelligence. Uh, Professor Habib, uh, the dais is yours. So we will have around 25 minutes for the presentation and maybe five minutes for the for the question and answer session. Thank you. Hello, Dr. Zahid. Hello. Yeah, we can hear you. We can hear you. Oh, good, good, excellent. Okay, so do you see my screen? Yes, we can see your screen. Perfect. Okay, let just a few moments to, okay, good. <laughs> Uh, everybody. Uh, okay, I am really very uh, happy and honored by this invitation and this participation uh, in this very interesting uh, topic and this uh, very nice morning. I am in, in the morning, uh, still in the morning now. So I know in uh, K few PM maybe is Friday in the in the PM. Um, I really appreciated uh, both of the presentations. So both talks. Um, let me okay. Okay, though uh, I, I I would like to uh, thank uh, Prof. Ali who uh, introduced the. Uh, uh, welcome uh, for his uh, warm welcoming at the at the beginning, and the organization committee. So, Dr. Mohammed Zahid Khan and Dr. Khuram uh, Qurashi, uh, both professors are uh, uh, I know both of them and collaborated uh, since since long time. Uh, as you said, Dr. Zahid, I spent uh, some years in Saudi Arabia in King Saudi University, and I've been honored for that. Um, really, what I will do in this presentation is uh, to give a kind of survey of uh, these activities or my activities and activities of my team uh, during the last decade um, and start, uh, try to. So, uh, I appreciated too much the presentation first by uh, Professor Tam, who uh, uh, introduced, started his presentation by. Uh, I have some souvenirs in my uh, in Canada with uh, the the setup of uh, the uh, Professor Hill in the uh, invention or the discovery of the uh, break gratings, and I worked in uh, uh, quite similar uh, setups in making break gratings over fiber. So I really very appreciated it, like uh, uh, close to thirty years ago, and uh, we have used this kind of setups for many times in. Laval University in the Center of Optics, Photonics, and Lasers. And we fabricated a lot of uh, uh, fiber break gratings. And uh, uh, I will go back later. And also, I appreciated a lot the, uh, the talk of uh, Professor Alan, who uh, uh, really uh, brought uh, like um, the, the, the features of the machine learning in different applications that Myself, I worked in these applications before, and you will see in this presentation, but without machine learning, because we worked on that a few years ago. So the machine learning and artificial intelligence is bringing a lot to the optical communication, optical sensing, and is uh, bringing a lot uh, to, to humankind in general. So I will go to... Um, so my my presentation will it it kind of combination. I will I will navigate between two uh, sets of slides. Uh, some of them uh, I, in, in I, I will start about uh, like introducing some of my actual activities and specifically. Uh, so okay, I as Doctor said, uh, Doctor Zahed introduced me. So I am professor in computer uh, computer department. I am also also advisor of the minister of the higher education scientific research in Tunisia, and director and founder of the Idea Lab. 
uh, and also former uh, co-founder of Reftonics for eSociety. So, and uh, Idea Lab, Idea Lab is uh, to the uh, we choose that that name to uh, which is uh, like acronym for artificial intelligence and data engineering laboratory. Uh, artificial intelligence and data engineering, as Dr. Lam said, uh, it's okay. It, it's it's uh, it's applied everywhere now, and maybe uh, you, you'll see. I choose this slide for the motivation. I am used since years and years to use the uh, the growth of the need of data bits, the need of uh, of uh, of bandwidth to support services. But really, what we need now, I think I should maybe close this. Okay, what we need now is uh, what I wanted to, to, to say by this slide, Web 3.0. What Web 3.0 is the coming, uh, the coming wave of services which are developed around uh, a human being and the human centric uh, services. When we talk about Web 3.0, we talk about semantic. Uh, instead of syntax, the semantic of the words we pronounce, the semantic of in, inside the music, inside the films, on the, inside the data, 3D, 3D data. Uh, we talk about also, so this is a new age of the web, which will carry all the services, okay, all these services, but below that services, we need an infrastructure, and this is the infrastructure that needed by photonics and sensing. Okay, so I, I, I so uh, data protection today in Web three point today in two point zero we have syntax based um, web uh, we have the data our data is not protected is monopolized in 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 uh, monopolized and is just okay given for free for to Google uh, Facebook etc. Is it's centralized in that companies. So the future should be decentralized. And we are, we start observing this kind of generation of Web 3.0 with a decentralized structures and decentralized solutions. So people in the future, based on Web 3.0, will own their data, will protect themselves their data. They should have the machines of the spaces in the cloud to protect their data. This will uh, be based on blockchain technology, and this will be the uh, the the like the, the the opportunity, or they will exploit at maximum artificial intelligence and machine learning. Be based on Web 3.0, we we will be able to make 3D for everybody, uh, 3D uh, cinema, 3D uh, services, uh, virtual, augmented, mixed reality. Uh, consists based on the not centralized uh, proof of work, but consensus proof of work, and so on, so on. So I choose this slide in order to 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 change the way we are used to motivate people in working on photonics and uh, in communication networks. Okay, this is uh, the traditional slide to say, okay, so we we need bandwidth. Okay, we since we. We were studying in our master and PhD degree. We use the same, but we have been like two G, three G now in for the six uh, G. But the issue is always the same. Uh, we need to make more advanced services with high value added services to people, and we need bandwidth. So we need networks, and to make that networks, we need devices, and we need photonics, we need radio frequency, and we need, we need terahertz technologies, etc and issue about cost. So what kind of applications uh, we are uh, interested in? So I think most of the people around the table are used to see this kind of, uh, kind of uh, uh, slides so that, uh, okay, uh, we talk about smart systems, smart cities. Uh, we talk about industry 4.0, now we, 
be passed to 5.0. Um, so uh, Internet of Things, uh, Internet Governance, uh, multi-parameter sensing, 5G, 6G, physical layer, all this physical layer we are used to work on and both of the talks in the beginnings, they covered uh, too many corners of this uh, physical layer. But I, 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 I wanted, when I suggested the title of this talk to Dr. Zahed, um, I wanted to be more, I wanted to bring more thoughts about how to deal with, we are used to use pure or 100% human-based intelligence uh, to, uh, to make our research and make our findings and find applications of our results, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So how this artificial intelligence with it's a multidimensional artificial intelligence that could bring how we can bring together this human and artificial intelligence. Really, I don't have answers, uh, but I have like questioning myself and questioning the audience and questioning my, my colleagues in the panel. But uh, so uh, the, the second presenter, the second talk presented some aspects, but artificial intelligence is really bringing a lot and impacting our life in everything, in almost everything. So this kind of thoughts. So let's say if I look to this fiber, oh, what is this? Okay, at the, at the, at the right is, uh, looks like normal fiber core, cladding, coating, et cetera. Um, and, and special multiplexing structures. So we did a lot. We have used our human intelligence to increase the density of uh, density of course, density of uh, wavelength channels, density of now few mode fibers or uh, on mode fibers. Now in the vortex vortex channels and OEM channels, we use all these was like quite inspirational. Do we think that artificial intelligence will be, will bring inspirations also for us? So at the left, what, what I presented here is a very simple refractive index profile. If you look at this, very, very simple shapes, okay? Very simple mathematical functions, okay? You can see the square functions, the rectangular functions, the kind of, uh, uh, Gaussian function, inverse Gaussian function. Uh, and these are used, inspired by what? All of these functions, myself, I have used, inspired by the duality we have learned in our uh, undergrad course, undergrad courses about uh, Fourier transforms from the time domain to the frequency domain and other Fourier transforms from the time domain to the space domain, when we talk about interferometric phenomena. Uh, if I come back to the presentation of uh, Professor Tang, when he uh, uh, presented the, the beginning of the creation or the discovery of the break gratings, it was an interference between two mathematical functions kind of sinusoidal functions. And this interference, there is constructive and destructive interference. So mathematically, it's very, very simple functions of uh, sum or superposition of two sinusoids or something like that. And we superpose also the, the uh, in the Fourier transform in, in or, or let's say in the frequency domain or in the space domain, uh, we, we, we make a result that is basically is we are playing with a few mathematical functions to navigate and transfer ourselves from one domain to, a, to another time, frequency, space. It's all about this. And basically we are, myself, I am publishing papers since 20 years or more, uh, is, is, is about, I am using the same ingredients, the same ingredients, applying them in different, in different applications. The break rating when it started is a just an, uh, 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 at the beginning is, a, is, a, is, a, is a, an overlap between two functions, two very simple functions, overlap, superposition, square function and sinusoidal function. And we did a lot of Fourier transform, inverse Fourier transform for and Z transform and other kinds of transforms also to discover different shapes of break ratings. And we have optimized 
the performance of the Bragg ratings. And we have made the Bragg ratings for um, WDM multiplexing and demultiplexing, and also for sensors, as the Professor Tam uh, introduced, for sensor time, uh, for frequency, uh, let, let's be, uh, okay, uh, for, for temperature sensors and uh, stress sensors and pressure and e uh, e uh, other applications. And all of them we have used, let's say, basic human inspirations. And now we use machine learning as in, introduced by the second uh, talk uh, to improve what we, we have been doing. But the future is, I expect a lot of change in the future. So I, I expect this kind of artificial minds around us, like, like we are making a research group based on uh, some artificial intelligence robots uh, and we are working with them and we are getting their ideas and in playing, et cetera. And, and I really, I will appreciate that in the discussion period, we talk about this kind of things. This is also rise function, rise cosine function. I learned that from the uh, from the basic uh, the, the, the signal processing, yeah, signal processing and signal transmission techniques, rise cosine function. I, I think I have been, my group have been the first to introduce that function. We brought this function from the signal processing the filtering technologies, et cetera. We brought that and we applied that in fiber optics and we designed novel fibers based or inspired by these rise of cosine functions. We did also for um, Gaussian functions. And in the last, uh, in, in the next slide, okay, rise of cosine, inverse rise of cosine. We used that for uh, single mode fiber modified or multi-mode fiber or uh, uh, OEM fibers, this kind of OEM fibers. We are also using these inspirational simple functions. Uh, this is tangent hyperbolic, hyperbolic. We have been also our group have been I mean, the, first, the first to introduce this function. Okay, we did not create it that. Huh? This is a Pythagore function, huh? trigonometric Pythagore function, huh? invented since, since like, uh, or created since thousands of years. Okay, but, but we, we use it some features of that, that function to say, okay, I, I think this is prob probably we apply if we make fibers and profile of fibers or profile of break gratings of, or to, to improve that feature or to have this kind of outcomes and the performance. So it's kind of inspirations. So the, this is the tangent, uh, tangent hyperbolic, the derivative of tangent hyperbolic, et cetera. And we made fibers and we got, we got the result. Of, the results we have expected just by intuition and even better than what, what we have expected. This kind, we, we made many publications out of that and it's all driven by uh, some inspiration. This is also hyper, uh, inverse hyper, uh, hyperbolic tangent fibers. Uh, and I, 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 could, I could say that maybe most of uh, uh, my works, okay, <laughs> and the contribution of the, uh, my team was around that. And uh, here, here we, use, we use also the basic characteristics of Fourier transform, inverse Fourier transforms, all this mathematical background to get to, get to, to uh, how to say, to, to concentrate the power in a specific direct functions, uh, P1, P2, P3, P5, direct functions. Uh, we create direct functions as perfect as possible. And we use that, this P1, P2, we use that just to, to, to monitor uh, the temperature, monitor the strain, et cetera, using our uh, fiber sensors, uh, fiber sensors, not break rating in that case, uh, but the specialty fibers. Uh, we play with the refractive index, and we use the features of these traditional functions, and uh, we arrive to, uh, to, to get really, uh, so we, we play with the parameters of these functions, uh, the curvature, et cetera, and we get these P1, P2, these peaks, okay? These peaks spaced, more spaced, or more closed, or correlated, or uncorrelated, et cetera, and then we take, for example, P1, and we observe what is the sensitive, how this moves when we, I change the temperature, I change pressure, I try to make uh, decorrelated behavior of these P1, of these peaks, et cetera, and all is inspired by, by uh, mathematical functions, by uh, 
signal processing background, etc. Uh, quantum communication, maybe the time alloc allocated is not. We are also trying to do the, the same thing to make to make a quantum fibers and quantum sensor, quantum based sensors. Uh, in, in that case, but inspiration uh, because the quantum world is quite different from uh, from our quite very physical world or very high high uh, let's hide dimension word something like that but quantum world is very different so inspiration get uh, by inspiration to get things it takes a lot of effort and we, we are doing some work on that um, this is the potential of quantum sensing uh, quantum based sensing in too many applications for sure including the applications that dr tam uh, introduce it in the beginning, like, like the train positions of the behavior of the corrosion in the in the train or the sensor of accelerations, for example, for towers or for different applications. Most of these applications are very well as presented is are very well mature. Okay, because of because also I think an ecosystem, ecosystem of industrial ecosystem and business ecosystem that is an interaction, in, in, in continuous interaction with research communities. Uh, if you look here, most of the, the, the work we have published, we are like in, uh, in, in, in a research, applied research mode, but we have delivered some prototypes, developed some advanced prototypes but it's very difficult to go to the level of industrialization because it takes the whole value chain. So we are more concentrating on like preliminary value chains, uh, but a preliminary segment of the, uh, the value chain. Okay, so uh, I cannot do better to introduce machine learning for optical communication, etc., because we, we got very, very nice presentation just a few minutes ago. Uh, this, uh, this kind of antenna design also, this is very nice application. This is one of my former students. He is now an um, assistant professor in Pakistan who did very, very nice work based on also inspiration. Huh? The, the antenna at the left, antenna at the left is really inspired by just shaping, huh? shaping and exploration and the shaping of the material to make uh, appropriate uh, antenna radiating 360 degree uh, covering the band uh, one to 10 gigahertz with very nice performance. And we got a patent about that because when we have analyzed the competition, uh, it was, it was, no, it was uh, yeah, we found nothing that cover all these kinds of bands with this compact kind of compact, uh, volume of antenna with very basic material, uh, very uh, inexpensive material at, at, at the center millimeter wave, uh, millimeter wave frequency at, at the end, uh, at, the, at the right. What we have here is very original work, okay? In, and th this work developed like uh, maybe six, seven years ago. Uh, this, this is antenna to capture solar, solar energy. Uh, so it's an energy harvesting using antenna. Uh, at that time where we have started that, that, uh, that, uh, that thesis, nobody believed on that. We had a lot of difficulty to publish because to publish had a lot of difficulty. It was very challenging to, to publish, but but at the end we have succeeded to publish. Now it's a product. Now it's a product, it's commercial uh, because the, the, the thing that we have thought about it was like looked very, very, uh, very early stage or very difficult to do, and we had very. It was very difficult to make antenna at that size. Uh, we, we, we did the collaboration between King Saudi University of Tonex and uh, University of um, Rennes University, Rennes University in France, and we have succeeded to just make like very initial demonstrations of the principle that we can really get through. Up the, the row, the antenna very small, antenna, narrow, uh, nano antennas, okay, to capture the wave or the optical wave, uh, optical wave, uh, 1.5 micron, etc. It's very difficult to capture. And even when you capture how to 
to get the DC current out of that, how to get energy out of that. It's very challenging. But the guy who is Walid, Walid Sethi, did very, very nice work. And uh, um, he was very resilient. Uh, it's very important for a PhD student to be resilient and for his advisor also. So uh, now I, I, I will talk about a few research projects that uh, <clears throat> maybe I should check the time. Yeah, Professor Fatad, I was about to say the same thing. You know, maybe I would appreciate if you can say uh, conclude in the next say five minutes to keep up with our Thank schedule. You. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank so you. Much. Okay, because I am a good professor, I know I, I have no limit about the time. Okay, <laughs> sorry, yeah, sorry for that. We, we are all good professors, but you know we don't count time. Uh, what we what we uh, we are engaged for is just to make people working well and making nice research, that's it. So, uh, okay, so I will survey quickly the, the, the research made with uh, Professor uh, Salah Shibili in the Reftonics. Uh, we did very nice work. We are very proud of this team, also very few individuals, but every, every individual, every one of them is a champion. Uh, we, we, we really succeeded. The, I'm proud that we have developed champions. We don't have hundreds of students. We did not advise a hundred of pieces, but they are, every one of them is a champion really in his, uh, in his access. So, okay, um, I will, I will try to go faster. Uh, this is, um, this project is, uh, okay, the, the evolution of technologies now, in, in, since many years now is working on SDM and most of the, uh, the work of the team is uh, using SDM in uh, making fibers and specialty fibers with high performance of space division multiplexing. Um, this project, this is a prototype we made with Agilent in Germany. And this is a real prototype. We have demonstrated at that time 0.5 terabit per second in a single channel. Right? Pay attention in a single wavelength, 0.5 terabit per second. And very quickly, we have increased it to many terabit per second. This is a real prototype developed by our students. Now we don't have hundreds of people. Um, this one is a uh, very interesting collaboration with KFUPM with Dr. Zahed. Thank you so much for that opportunity that we have met together and made. Uh, Made in, in made roadmap of collaborations, and we have explored to use this quantum dash laser. If you look at the uh, at the left, it's a quantum dash with like very noisy laser. And most of or the start of our collaboration is how may how to transform that laser to a very nice with very pure peak of laser. And this was. We, brought, we experienced many uh, uh, solutions for uh, external cavity based uh, principles, and we have succeeded to, many, to make many, many uh, publications and different settings of that. Here also is Majid Ismail, uh, my former student, did very nice work. This chamber we made that piece by piece design, etc. And this chamber emulates the dust storm in Saudi Arabia, the desert of Saudi Arabia. This is one of the, we spent more than one year just to build that, okay? Build that in the right way. And we built the first version and second version. But this chamber, uh, th this investment in this chamber is, was very beneficial. We made like tens of papers out of that. You, you look for the OEM, uh, OEM. And we also, the, the setup has been exploited by too many other universities and people came to explore uh, the setup to make real experiments. Uh, this work for Lockheed Martin also about radar. We have exploited the photonics based at the same setting, same knowledge to make radars. Radars are very special. Photonics radar are very strategic to the future because it's, uh, it's, um, in the future we have to detect very small objects like drones very small objects and these kind of radars we need photonics to, to make this this capacity this capability for detecting using radars very small objects and all the associated applications of that this is our design and this is our prototype and working prototype very proud of that with very limited resources again um, 
this jo this project joins the the presentation the the second speaker uh, the uh, second speaker about automatic modulation classification so because we have succeeded to make more than terabit per second per wavelength using high uh, modulation techniques so this project is uh, to apply machine learning things to make the uh, to detect evaluate channel impairments to uh, better detect the symbols etc uh, this is the same project. Uh, uh, Professor Fatada, I think we are unable to hear you. The lab to make terahertz communication, many. Uh, or uh, hello, it's better now. Hello, hello. Yes, hello. yes, it's better now. Professor Zahad. Yes. Okay. Okay. Alhamdulillah. Uh, sorry. Uh, sorry for the interruptions. Uh, question of internet quality. We need more photonics for this uh, these networks. Uh, so this is this is an application also that we have built a few years ago about using break greetings and uh, break greetings for is exactly as introduced by Professor um, Tam in the beginning. So break ratings for to protect strategic uh, cities and the strategic infrastructure. It could be infrastructure, electric infrastructure. It could be pipelines. It could be anything. Okay. So this is, and we built that in our laboratory uh, in, in uh, King Saud University. This is also, uh, these pictures show what kind of problematic we can address using fiber break rating. And sometimes break ratings is not enough. Okay. Maybe a question I, I, I a question for uh, Professor Tam. Um, okay, this is this current project. So we use also machine learning methods to uh, better detect images. Okay, better detect images for intrusions, etc. Uh, we we use also to to, to uh, self supervise the transformers for background world representation without any. So here I came back to Tunisia huh, uh, in these slides. So they detect images applying uh, with with other. Uh, okay, here is uh, for for healthcare and for the uh, for the detection also of the behavior of people in the, in surrounding. Too many applications using machine learning and artificial intelligence. This is also to detect um, another application, and so on. Uh, thank you so much. I hope this uh, this was beneficial for uh, the audience. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Fatada. Uh, so any any questions from the attendees or from the panelists? Uh, okay, if not, then uh, maybe uh, we can move to our next speaker as we are you know running out of time. Uh, again, thank you very much, Professor Fatada, for your talk. Uh, and I would like to now uh, welcome our last speaker, uh, Dr. Yating Wong. Uh, and <clears throat> Dr. Yating, uh, she is now an assistant uh, professor at KAUST. Uh, before that, uh, she worked in Professor John Bower's uh, group at UCSB from 2017 to 2022 as a postdoc and <clears throat> research associate. Uh, her research is in the area of uh, silicon photonics and special emphasis on integration of on-chip light sources for data communication, biosensing, energy harvesting, machine vision, and quantum information processing. Uh, she received a 2016-17 School of Engineering PhD Research Excellence Award in uh, HKUST and uh, you know, 2021 Clio Tingi Innovation Award and in 2018 Pierce Young Scientist Award and very recently in 2021 OGC Best Young Scientist Award and she was also selected as a finalist of 2022 Rising Stars of the Light and she has published more than uh, 60 peer-reviewed research papers including 36 first author journals and 24 uh, conferences uh, and uh, I think now uh, I would like to give the stage to uh, Dr. Wong uh, for her uh, presentation. Thank you very much, Dr. Wong. Thank you, Zahid. Uh, so can everyone see my slides? Uh, yes, we can see your slides. 
Oh, great. Uh, so hi, everyone. Um, I'm Yating, an assistant professor in Kaust. So it's very nice to meet everyone virtually. And uh, thanks to uh, Dahil again for inviting me in this great forum organized by KFUPN and IRC CSS. So in this talk, uh, I'll discuss integrated silicon photonics with on-chip lasers for optical sensing and communication applications. So first, I will give an overview on silicon integrated photonics and discuss my latest research achievements in high-performance quantum dot devices, mainly lasers, integrated on industry standard silicon substrate. Then I'll discuss the integration scheme that have been poured to integrate these quantum dot devices on silicon platform with the aim of process simplicity, high device performance, and commercial viability. And finally, I'll uh, end with a conclusion uh, on future perspective in incorporating these photon integrated circuits with ultra blazers for different applications. Uh, so uh, what is integrated photonics? Integrated photonics is an emergent branch of photonics in which waveguides and devices are fabricated as an integrated structure onto the surface of a flat substrate. So allowing for the improvement in performance as well as the reduction in terms of size, weight, power consumption, and cost. So previously, the photon integration circuit has been entirely based on indium phosphide and the three fine materials. But now we are switching to silicon. We are making photon integrated circuits. The same way as electronic integrated circuits are made, that can leverage from the most advanced signals processing with low price, high yield, and good thermal and mechanical properties. So the big demands today of data centers, particularly for artificial intelligence and machine learning, as discussed by the previous speakers, will continue to drive the need for foster applications and computations in the next decade. So this data traffic is projected to grow at a 25% compound annual growth rate for the next four years. So now the three nanometers chips will be evolved next year by TSMC for Apple iPhone and Macs, and two nanometer chips will be available in 2025. And Broadcom's roadmap has a split chip going from 51.2 terabit this year to 102 terabit in 2024 and 205 terabit in 2026. So this will all be the economic driver for silicon photonics getting into much higher capacity in the future. So there have already been a variety of photonic devices being put on silicon, including uh, the low loss waveguides, modulators, switches, uh, detectors, uh, MEMS, and nonlinear materials. And the foundry uh, efforts across the entire world, especially in North America, Europe, and Asia, are quickly pushing the commercialization and the wide deployment of silicon photonics uh, with good thermodynamic properties, uh, extremely low loss waveguides. We're talking about 0 0.03 dB per centimeter. Uh, Lost wave guys and excellent optical confinement um, and the 300 millimeter wafer scale, high throughout processing and high volumes and a low cost. So this increasing number of players are now in the race of silicon photonics. Uh, for example, uh, Intel's 100 and on 100G transceivers based on silicon photonics are now in volume production. And uh, Cisco is currently uh, simplifying the 100G pipe wall optics and beyond, uh, and occasionally engaged for a coherent silicon photonics. Uh, AIM could uh, provide wafer scale tests, simply and packaging for silicon photonics chip, manufacturing in a 60 nanometer node, and uh, global boundaries are working on the 300 millimeter wafers. However, at the same time, silicon is a kind of a bad material for photonics. So device made uh, from silicon and germanium can only, can only cover modulation and detection for wavelengths around the near infrared, but are not suitable outside that range. Silicon is reciprocal, so you cannot make isolators and circulators from silicon materials. Additionally, silicon is indirect bank at so they are not suitable for making high performance lasers or amplifiers. And actually the only demonstrated laser in this kind of material system have order the magnitude, higher spatial current density than what can be achieved in this direct bank as three fine materials. As a result, to overcome the inherent limitations of good form materials for gain, efficient modulation, and detection at a wavelength outside the in your infrared, requires we incorporate the three fine materials with the silicon photonics platform. 
So to integrate three buff lasers onto the second substrate, the first generation of uh, this hybrid integration fabricate the three five devices and the silicon devices separately, and then mount the three five dies on top of the silicon photonics dies using external coupling. So one obvious advantage of hyper integration is it has the capability to optimize the active and the passive separately without sacrificing for process compatibility. However, this optical packaging with optical alignment often occupies over 90% of the total cost. And the efficient optical coupling of the 3.5 to silicon photonics waveguides usually uh, relies on uh, alignment with precision in the lower micrometer or even sub micrometer range, leading to large footprint and very limited scalability. So uh, another approach, uh, heterogeneous integration, um, can actually bound this unpatterned um, 3 by thin films to the signal wafers at the early to middle stage with a coarse alignment, and then define the device by lithography on the full wafer scale. So as a result, the overall efficiency is very high, reaching coupling loss lower than your 5.0 dB per interface. And with the chip maker Intel, um, <laughs> This device was used uh, already used in mass production lines after simply 10 years of its demonstration, and it's now generating over 1 billion of revenue nowadays. In addition, this technique can not only offer an elegant path to include uh, three fab lasers onto the silicon photonics platform, but also makes it possible to flexibly add different functionalities, different materials onto the same chip despite the material incompatibility. For example, uh, the Indian Boltzmann materials for telecommunication, Gena Arsenide based materials for 850 nanometer big cell, and uh, lysanalvate for modulators, um, some uh, in-gas materials for voltage detectors, uh, silicon nitride, silicon oxide nitride for ultra low loss waveguides, and the YG uh, materials for isolators. However, the associated uh, technical complexity is still considerable, in particular with um, um, the very strange requirement and ultra clean and extremely smooth surface before bonding. Moreover, the use of 3 5 substrate for the laser growth can be costly, and that imposes a limit on the maximal bonding uh, size set by the largest available 3 5 substrate, which is around 200 mm for gain and 150 mm for indium phosphide, which are much more smaller and much more expensive than a silicon counterpart. So, considering the 3 5 substrate cut, cost, monolithic integration through direct epitaxial growth is a more economically favorable option and can also provide the best natural heat thinking for laser operation. However, there is fundamental uh, material difference between uh, the 3 phi and the silicon during that potential growth that can generate high density of uh, crystalline defects, including primarily the threading dislocations, stacking force, and antiphase domains. So these defects can act as non-radiative recombination, recombination centers that grow with the device operation into this digital, digital um, dislocation network and finally large network of dark line defects that degrade the device performance and shorten the lifetime. So while people has been trying to grow the quantum well lasers directly on silicon um, in the early 1980s, and actually they have got this um, pretty nice results in terms of our special current, uh, light alpha power, and external quantum efficiency. And so this kind of performance are, all, are almost comparable to native substrate performance. However, if you look at the aging past, the maximal device lifetime is less than 200 hours, like in, in spite of like decades of research, um, even with um, very low TDD and even with very time consuming growth, uh, even with the off silicon substrate that is not the most compatible. So in this kind of scenario, how can we improve 3-5 lasers on silicon by orders of magnitude? So the strategy here we use is to deal with actor region and quantum dots can be used instead of quantum wells. So what is quantum dot? The quantum dot represents this zero dimensional article in a box like quantum confined structures that can be formed through this self-assemble process using uh, indian arsenic and angan arsenic layers. So due to this three dimensional confinement or carriers, a complete localization of electrons and holes can ideally give 
rise to the sequence of the other function in those days. Possessing analog degeneracy. As a result, quantum dot can promise a lot of performance advantages over its quantum well counterparts, uh, including its high temperature tolerance that allow robust CW operation up to 220 degrees C and a low special currents that is capable to support very low energy consumption. More importantly, uh, for line wings uh, enhancement factor, or we call alpha factor. So the typical value for quantum wall is around three to five, but quantum dot is 15 times smaller. So from this scaling factor, you can see that the critical feedback level for coherence collapse is closely related to this alpha factor. And quantum dot has over 50 dB increase in its value compared to quantum wells, such that even with 90% of the light reflected back to the laser, so um, the optical and other spectrum still shows no coherence collapse. On the contrary, for quantum well devices, complete coherence collapse will happen even at a very low feedback level of minus 25 dB. So this kind of property is very important to data communication system because with this uh, reflection tolerant quantum dot actor region, you don't have to add isolators into the system to block the undesired reflections, which is bulky, expensive, and can greatly complicate the packaging and as additional insertion loss. In addition, for a carrier diffusion lens, the typical value for quantum wells is around uh, 10, 10 microns, but quantum dot is 10 times smaller. So in the case of relatively high spreading dislocation density, so we are talking about uh, 3 e, uh, to the order of 8. Uh, this is a very, very high uh, defined density. But the carriers in the quantum wells, they are afraid to move around with a plane in the well, and they can encounter a defect before we combine radiatively. But in a quantum dot, since uh, every quantum dot is quite locally trapped, and the chance of carrier mitigation to dislocation and be trapped by the dislocation trap state was greatly reduced. So uh, for example, so uh, if you see this red point uh, refers to the defects and this yellow dot refers to the quantum dot, and even with this very high spread in this case density, because the dot density is still more than two orders of magnitude larger, and because each dot just stays at its position, they are independent of each other. So one dislocation the, um, line can only kill one or a few dots, and the majority of the dots are not affected. So device can still work efficiently. So this much improved device tolerance gives rise to record long device lifetime on silicon. So while uh, I mentioned that uh, the maximum lifetime of quantum well lasers grow on silicon has only 200 hours after several decades of research, our generation one uh, quantum dial device already show lifetime of 800 hours at 30 degrees C, and our most recent results show a uh, median hour extrapolated lifetime at 80 degrees C. So this is a kind of a remarkable uh, uh, improvement compared to our first generation of devices and also orders of magnitude longer compared to any previous lifetime test of quantum well lasers actually grown on a silicon substrate. So there is a, a lot of recent progress of quantum dot devices grown on silicon, such as the sub-wavelength optically pumped micro disc lasers, the submillion uh, threshold electrically micro ring lasers, this couple cavity uh, tunable lasers, this high speed DFB lasers, this isolator free uh, system demonstration showing a pass towards high volume, low cost transceiver that can be scaled to beyond one terabit per second, this 20 gigahertz Moloch lasers with high channel count and excellent RF performance, this high gain, high saturation output power semiconductor optical amplifiers, and ultra low dark current voltage detectors, uh, which has dark current five orders of magnitude lower than the state of the art Germania on silicon for the detectors. But in addition to improvement of material quality and individual quantum dial device performance, we are particularly interested to achieve uh, the low loss active passive coupling of 3 5 with the silicon waveguides so that we can form a full energy photonic circuits. And the most challenging part here is that we need to change from uh, the Indian full swipe based quantum well API to Gania style uh, based quantum dot API that needs totally different material systems and different device design and process optimization. 
So here the schematic showing the quantum dot laser integrated on the SOI substrate consisting of this hybrid three active region coupled to passive silicon waveguides. So the process is start always the passive waveguide process and then the subsequent wafer bonding and the substrate removal, removal. And then etch the three five means are precisely down to the end contact layer and keep the etching uh, that's uniformly across the whole wafer. So for this step, a lot of process optimization was devoted to achieve this smooth and straight side work and so that we can get this very nice three pop taper. And uh, after this uh, P Mesa pa paddling, and then we pattern this lower end gas contact uh, tapered in a separate shot transition. And then we put this metal stacks as contact metals, and the device was passivated, and the via was opened for a pro metal. So uh, the laser shows a uh, special current of 4 million, sample saturation of 60 dB, uh, CW uh, temperature of 75 degrees C. But what I want to emphasize is the modulation bandwidth and the line width. So as you know, uh, a very high uh, modulation bandwidth has always been recognized as very difficult to attain for quantum dot lasers. So actually the best reported value on native substrate is around 10 gigahertz. Uh, and that's been using a very short cavity and with a lot of treatment. But here we got a record high value of 13 gigahertz achieved with just the polished facets and with these very long uh, cavity devices. And which means there is still remaining a lot of room to further improve it, uh, reduce the cavity lens, uh, add appropriate facet coating, deposit the metal on a thick dielectric for low capacitance, et cetera. And for laser line waste, which is closely related to alpha factor, due to the 15 times smaller alpha factor in quantum dots compared to quantum wells, we got 26 kilohertz, which is an order of magnitude lower compared to the typical solitary quantum well laser uh, line waste which is several megahertz. So again, this paper compares the device performance of this work and previously reported work, which uh, I want to show again that laser with a silicon waveguide can significantly outperform lasers without a silicon waveguide in terms of line waves, band waves, cytomol special ratio, et cetera, which we are very excited about as it shows a synergistic relationship between the unique capabilities of three by quantum dots and a silicon, allowing for not only um, uh, uh, reduce of cost due to the economic scale, due to the larger, smaller substrate, but also much better device performance, exceeding what is achievable uh, with purely three by quantum dot devices. So when you put lasers on silicon, you not only get a better substrate, you also get better lasers. So following this direction, we now cooperated with Intel and is using Intel the 300 millimeter silicon photonics platform to pattern the passive uh, part and to be bound with our quantum dot API. So the heat agency integration process has been uh, very successful in Intel with mass production lines. So by changing out the bound the quantum well attached material for quantum dot on silicon substrates, uh, there will be substantial opportunities to build upon what has been achieved through heterogeneous integration to both improve performance and reduce cost. And in addition, this kind of dense device integration with on chip lasers in silicon photonics uh, will be ideal for any applications that have high volume needs to be scaled regularly. So uh, the use of silicon photonics in datacom is well established. So Intel, you know, is having a billion dollar business, business doing that. And many other companies are also actively involved. And with the foundry efforts from TCMC, Global Foundries, uh, in and Tower, there will be tons of opportunities open for other applications as well. Uh, LIDA, gyroscopes, the spectroscopy, for example. So uh, telecommunication, uh, as Acacia has demonstrated, is a second high volume application with a superior performance from silicon processing really helps and the lithography in a 65 nanometer process is far better than the typical uh, in the force by foundry. And furthermore, uh, silicon photonics already show uh, promise as a platform for quantum computation, and quantum dots show promise as a source of entangled single uh, photons compatible with the proposed computation schemes. So this kind of related research is due in the following stage. But if quantum dots can be integrated in silicon photonics or 
uh, for classical applications, this established process that it makes sense to create a uh, grant an extra consideration in design huge quantum computation computation platforms. And uh, for neuromorphic uh, photonics, we are, which we are particularly interested in. So the current approach of fiber cup packaging is uh, the most straightforward way to get light into the chip. But in the future version, especially spiking your uh, networks, on-chip laser source would be required so that all optical signals will be confined within an integrated circuit package for efficiency, stability, and scalability. Uh, another general application is optical LiDAR. So um, although the cost has must be small and the complexity must be large for an optical phase array. And shifting the beam around uh, needs to be matched to the electronic drivers to control the optical phase array. So it becomes more important to have chips on the same substrate for 3D integration. And finally, uh, for uh, photonic biosensors with integrated light sources, the price will be significantly reduced and the size will also be significantly reduced which is very important for polymer devices. So uh, again, by leveraging all these attractive features of integrated synchrophotonics and the advanced PDK from Intel and, the, um, and this heterogeneous uh, process, on chip laser will revolutionize these applications uh, for substantial performance gains, uh, grain solutions, and mass production. So to, to conclude, uh, we have achieved a lot of progress in the last six years. Uh, laser integration for photonics is definitely the key to advanced photon angry circuits and the solution that can best leverage the economics of scale while maintaining the highest yield will be. So with the global race, and I'll see that Intel is leading the commercial end of it, and we are looking uh, to work uh, to uh, lead the research end of it. And finally, and most importantly, I'd like to thank uh, my integrated photonics lab in KAUST, uh, and also my postdoc supervisor, Professor John Bowers, and the UCSB group. And also, I'd like to thank uh, all my collaborations, uh, particularly Heisen Rohn's group at Intel, uh, um, for contributing so much to this work. Uh, in the meantime, I'd like to since there are many uh, KFUPM students, I'd also like to use this opportunity to share the news that PhD student fellowship positions are now available in my group for 2023 animation. And we also have Cal's global fellowship programs open uh, to postal applications. Uh, successful applica applicants will get access to the state-of-the-art um, uh, re research um, for to, to do semiconductor research. And that's good. And also, you know, uh, Calst uh, ranks first in the world. Um, oh, okay. So Calst ranks first in the world for citations for faculty in the QS uh, world ranking and top 20 in the world of fastest writing universities. And this is a beautiful place with Rassi just steps away and we provide work play lead environment with the state of the art business facilities. And uh, we are also very international. Uh, we have probably the, um, we rank first in the percentage of international students and uh, international faculty. So you will enjoy the diversity and uh, international university community. And also our Lumini uh, are contributing to industry and innovation around the world with 65% employed in top industries and 23% in academia in three institutions. And before you make this big decision, we also offer some short period intense uh, safe camps and schools during uh, a specific seasons to help you uh, pract uh, practice and uh, get some skills uh, to and introduce you to the research project. So we have this microtronics dinner camp and a photonic summer camp. And so if you're interested, uh, please send your CV, your research plan and transcript to transcript to my email. So I expect the students to be uh, very uh, self-motivated, have uh, creative ideas and are willing to tackle important problems. And I'll be happy to chat before your applications. So um, yeah, uh, that's all. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Dr. Wan. Uh, so uh, let's open the floor for any questions. So any questions from the attendees? Uh, you can raise your hand and we can allow you to talk or even from the panelist. 
uh, not much. Maybe, uh, you know, before concluding, if I may ask one question, uh, Dr. Yating, uh, you have mentioned a, a little bit about, you know, the, the quantum communications, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, would you be able to comment more on, you know, how this quantum dots on silicon uh, would help uh, enable uh, the single photon or entangled photon sources? And is it possible to have an electrical driven, uh, driven type of such sources in near future, or is it you know already been uh, established? I see. So uh, in terms of doing quantum, there are always different approaches. Like the U.S., uh, the U.S. and Europe have different voices, and people argue for years. Like the U.S. thinks like uh, they want to do quantum using certain carbides on things like that and when Europe thinks uh, we like quantum dots so for from our side I think uh, if you can um, the using quantum dot to do a uh, quantum compu uh, computation um, the really uh, main challenge is really how you can get this very uniform quantum dot for single photon source so because you, you know uh, generally the quantum dots are grown by self-assembled process we call this sk mode pro sk mode uh, process so in this kind of process it's very difficult to control the dot so it's very difficult to get uniform and uh uniform and identical dots, especially it's very difficult to uh, reduce the dot density. So, you know, increase the dot density is difficult, but to reduce the dot density is also very difficult. So how can you get this very uniform um, dot uh, growth and how can you um, make the density very low so that you can just figure out the exact dot you want. And for a uh, single follow source, I think that's the main challenge. If you are pursuing uh, this uh, quantum dot approach, that like if you are if you are in a, in US and followed by the US government, then you have no choice. You can just uh, switch to another direction using thin carbide something. So that's a totally different story. Okay. okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Dr. Wan. Uh, so uh, this actually uh, concludes our second session, and I would like to thank all our speakers uh, for their great talk. Uh, then we have just few minutes left. We have a very short panel uh, discussion, uh, you know, in fact, a very short one. So, you know, uh, uh, I would appreciate that, you know, maybe we can do the following. So we have Professor Tam here, uh, Professor Fatadai here, and Dr. Vaughn here. Uh, so, you know, uh, we have our graduate students here. So maybe, you know, uh, uh, on behalf of our uh, committee, I would like to just pose a question uh, to in front of the speakers and maybe the speakers can provide their thought uh, maybe and summarize it in a, in a minute or minute and a half and after that we will we will conclude the talk so you know the question you know that that we have is you know again you know uh, for a green uh, secure and a resilient digital society uh, of the future so what research directions in photonics uh, would you prefer to recommend to our young generation of researchers uh, in this region, which is Middle East, uh, as well as around the world. So this is the question. So if I may repeat again, uh, for a green, secure, and resilient digital society of the future, what research directions in photonics would you prefer to recommend to our young generation of rece uh, researchers uh, in this region and uh, around the world. So uh, maybe I would I would I would like to start uh, with uh, Professor Tam. Okay. Uh, obviously, I'll talk. About, uh, I would recommend uh, applying uh, AI or machine learning to a photonic sensing network. And, and I, I think there's a, a lot of potential there because. Um, even now, if you will look at uh, most of the paper, they are using a uh, fiber optic sensor, for example, like uh, FPG uh, sensor. Now, one thing I did not mention about the, the, the power of an FPG sensor is really um, <clears throat> that it can measure virtually any parameter. We, we use it to measure uh, physical parameter, bi biological uh, uh, parameter, and also chemical. Now, there's there actually one slide uh, that I on, only showed the picture, but I didn't go into uh, the detail. It, 
what we are doing now is actually we make spatialized uh, fiber. We make fiber in a spatial type of polymer. And, and we design the, the, the fiber uh, depending on the particular application that, uh, <coughs> that um, we're looking at. Now, one of the, uh, one of the exciting uh, example is, um, I think probably two uh, exciting example using uh, uh, fiber grading sensor is <clears throat> in the medical area. I think there's a lot of potential there, okay? And, um, <clears throat> and also is uh, something that is uh, uh, really needed in the society. Uh, so one of the application is actually, uh, we are collaborating with a hospital and also uh, the University of Melbourne and trying to develop the so-called smart cochlear implant, okay? Now, there are actually many people uh, in the world suffering about hearing loss, okay? They appear, some, 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 some baby actually when they're born, they can't hear. And uh, some uh, because of the uh, uh, accident, okay? And they hear damage and they could not hear. And the only solution is, is actually implant a uh, cochlear. Okay, so, so you, you implant, so like what we call it is the cochlear implant. Now, what the doctor is doing now is the surgeon can do is they actually have a drill three holes, okay, behind your head. Uh, and then they insert a tiny implant in there. Now, the problem with that is uh, it's a very effective uh, solution, but it's very costly. So, so what we're trying to do is uh, we try to reduce the cost by, by actually uh, embedding sensor inside this tiny cochlear implants. Okay, so that's never been done before. And uh, if the cochlear implant, uh, what we call a, uh, a smart cochlear implant, um, if you have a sensor, then it will significantly make the operation easier. And obviously, it will um, have a much mm -hmm. uh, higher success rate and the cost will reduce. And then more people can benefit. Uh, from having this so-called smart cochlear implant. So this, this is one area I think uh, is, uh, we just started, not many people working on it. And I, I think it, it need a lot more researcher and um, also uh, it need a, a lot more uh, like funding to uh, invest into it. And uh, more students uh, or, or, or perhaps professor uh, looking into this problem. This is, I think is uh, it's a huge problem. And uh, if it can be solved, then uh, many people can benefit. And I, I think operations, something like that probably costs like about 200,000 US. So not many people can afford it at the moment. Yeah, it's a very expensive, very de delicate, a uh, very delicate um, uh, surgery. So hopefully once you, in, once you can implant a fiber sensor in there, you can significantly reduce the cost. Now, another area they're working uh, on is actually in helping, uh, looking at the, um, the, uh, the bone, okay? One, if, if, you, if uh, someone has an accident, they have their bone replaced, then um, if you can actually monitor the he healing process, it can also help a lot. But then that will also require a lot of uh, research, actually developing a spatial fiber that can go inside the body, and then develop this, uh, the entire monitoring system that can be embedded inside the body, okay, to monitor the, uh, uh, the, uh, the healing process. Uh, using IoT, and this is actually something we are, we're working on. So we're trying to miniaturize the entire interrogator into something that is very small that you can embed under the skin. Yeah, so, so that uh, also can benefit a lot of people. So, so there, are many, there, there are many areas. So I'll just stop there and let other uh, yeah. uh, uh, speaker uh, share their, <laughs> their views. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Tam. Uh, now maybe I will I will open the floor for Professor Fatala if he can say share uh, you know his opinion uh, in the next one one and a half minutes. Okay, thank you, uh, but, uh, Okay, I, I would not suggest necessarily specific directions, but I would say I I, I will uh, underline specific values. The value of open science is very very important very important to share our knowledge and science with everybody. It's very important to increase the accessibility to science, to the right, to, to, to technology and to knowledge. 
to every body around the world. Um, okay, so the, the value of sharing science, the value of passion also. So I ask students to be passionate by science, not publications. Forget about publications. Get, get the time to do nice work where you, 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 you feel yourself uh, flourishing, you feel yourself uh, uh, happy to make that work. And uh, maybe in terms of tools, I think uh, the, the quantum age uh, and the quantum paradigm is, is, is not now obvious and it's very necessary to work on and consider it in all different aspects. Okay, um, also the artificial intelligence, all uh, and all the 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 bricks or the puzzle pieces in artificial intelligence. Uh, it it affects everything. It's not just the, uh, the it's not just the communication. Uh, communication level, but also device and also this as. Um, uh, Professor Latin uh, presented also the device of the materials, the future materials, the future everything will be based as as the mathematics have played a very strong role in everything in, in making everything. Uh, artificial intelligence will ta take a lot of that role, so it's very important. Um, and try try to try try just in, in mindset to have. Okay, serve people, serve people, serve what is what people need. Okay, not what the industry needs. Okay, serve people, think about people. By the end, you will make our, your project and you will find your, your specific road. Maybe you will make your startup. You will, you, will, you will make your own success. But I think values is first. And the cutting edge technologies and tools is second. So artificial intelligence, quantum age and quantum paradigm, and good knowledge sharing, that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Fatada, for, uh, for the nice message. Uh, Dr. Uh, Yating Wong, maybe if you can say comment. Uh, yeah, I agree everywhere, uh, Professor Tan and Professor uh, I have Habib talk about uh, the importance of AI and machine learning. And I want to add that uh, for saying that in world AI and machine learning, uh, they took huge amount of computer, computa uh, computing capacity. And for data centers to handle that, they need the transition from electronics to photonics, uh, which is simply due to the fact that capacity of an optical fiber is a thousand times uh, that of an electric wire. And a signal loss in a fiber optics is about a thousand times lower than electronic wires. And to make this transition from electronics to photonics possible, uh, we have to uh, do the integration. The same similar way, like how electronics win, like, you know, three nanometer chips is uh, in volume last year by TSMC in iPhone and Mac and two nanometer will be available in 2025. So to make all this possible, integration is the key. And photonic integration previously has been entirely on the, in the full slide. Uh, we're talking about this two, uh, two inch or four inch uh, small, um, small wafers to be processed in the foundry. And this kind of three, three five materials. But now we are switching to silicon. And we are making photonic integration circuits the same way as electronic integration circuits are made. So I think it's a very uh, interesting, um, uh, interesting research direction, and it's a global race. So I will say that uh, Intel is leading the commercial end of it, and we are working to lead the research end of it. So again, AI is very important, and machines is very important. They make us a better world, and uh, photonic integration are the things that make AI, make machine learning possible. Thank you, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Wong. So uh, I think with that, uh, we, will, we will close our panel discussion. And uh, Professor Azadine, if you can uh, turn on your camera, maybe we can have one, one nice picture of, of all of us. <laughs> uh, Professor Azadine, if you can hear me. Uh, I think I think he's busy. Well, anyways, uh, Dr. Khura, maybe you can take the lead in 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 concluding the the forum. Um, thank you very much. Uh, I would like to thank all our distinguished guests and speakers. It was really very insightful. We really enjoyed uh, your talks. Uh, very informative, and I hope our students, the grad students, have 
um, you know, uh, got benefit out of it. And hopefully somebody will take a work from, uh, from one of your uh, works that you have talked about and work on it in future and could be our future uh, professors and leaders in the field. Uh, so thank you once again, all the speakers for your time and patience with us. Thank you very much. And hopefully see you around uh, in some conference, meet you somewhere, or maybe virtually again, uh, hopefully. So thank you very much, all the speakers and the guests and the students. Uh, hope we'll see you again. Okay, thank bye. You. Thank you very much. Well, uh, just one minute. Let me let me take a picture and, and, then, <laughs> okay. and then we'll stop, okay? Okay, thank you very much. Just, just give me a minute. And let me just verify it, please, whether I have I have got the picture or not. It's fair with us. <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, you know, otherwise, you know, it's it's difficult. We will we will not be able to have have picture together. <laughs> Just one minute. Yes, yes. Thank you very much. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Have Thank you very much. Bye. 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 -bye.